whether you think you know it or not, <laughs> whether you think you need it or not. Instant in season and out of season. And look at how the preaching is to be done. This is important. This is important. He says that he is supposed to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Listen to me. These three things are the primary characteristics of biblical preaching. And it ain't the things that people like. Reprove. Biblical teaching corrects you. In order to be corrected, you have to come to a realization through what the Bible says that you're wrong. That's counterculture to our, to our world and our culture. Listen to me, it's counterculture to our church today. We don't want to be told that we're wrong, let alone we don't want to be convicted that we are wrong in whether what we believe or how we are living. It says that I'm supposed to, as a biblical preacher, reprove you with the word of God and convince you why the biblical way is better than your way or better than the world's way. It says reprove. And not only, that's the light one. It also says that the biblical preacher is supposed to rebuke. <laughs> well, that's a word you don't hear much these days, especially in the church. You know what rebuke means? It means that I, as the pastor of the church, have the authority, if you are a member of the church that comes under the leadership of this church, I have the authority to challenge you. I have the authority to call you out, not on my opinion, not on my mindset, not by my wants and my desires, but by what the Bible says. And it's for your benefit, not to your detriment. Listen to me, folks. We live in a day and age that if the pastor tries to correct somebody in the church, they leave. I, I, yeah, come on. So, some, of, some of you guys, uh, you're here because your former pastor tried to correct you and you decided to leave. There's a lot of people who have left Grace Church because the pastor tried to correct them directly or indirectly and they've left. Some of y'all thinking about getting up and walking out right now. I don't know. But folks, listen to me. It means to call out. Your pastor should be able to correct you without you leaving the church. That's called spiritual leadership and spiritual authority. If you don't believe it, then why are you a member of a church? Not just rebuke, but exhort. What does exhort mean? Exhort means to stir up. Exhort means to call forward. This is where a lot of things come when you have an invitation, right? Biblical preaching should lead you to make a decision. It should show you the right decision that needs to be made and compel you to want to come forward. Now that's on the work of the Holy Spirit, but a decision needs to be there. I'm not just up here to spout information to you. I'm here to get you to move closer to the cross, whether it's for salvation or whether it's closer to the cross for sanctification. It's supposed to get you to move. Every time you come in this building on a Sunday morning, you should not leave here the same way you walked in. You should leave here changed because you have heated yourself to the word and allow the Holy Spirit to move and work within you. It should move you. It should move you. It should call you forward. And I love this. He says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. L listen to me. <laughs> Those are all basically, except for the last one, negative characteristics of preaching. It flies in the face of our culture that tries to get you to feel good every time you hear so-called preaching and teaching. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But folks, in order for biblical preaching to get done, there has to be a negative aspect to it. That's why the surgery takes place between, you know, the Word of God in Hebrews 4.12, that it cuts and it slices, and its job is to separate the spirit from the flesh and lead you in all matters of truth. The only way that can happen is for something negative for, to be revealed and for you to see the good news and the positive of Christ. But he says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Characteristics of biblical preaching in the final charge. Listen to me. 
I love it. He gives Timothy a disclaimer with all long suffering and doctrine. How many guys remember the definition, the Greek definition I gave you last week of long suffering? What does it mean in the Greek? To suffer long. Very good. Very good. Right? You know what he's telling Timothy? Timothy, you are going to reprove these people, you are going to rebuke these people, you are going to exhort these people, and change is not going to happen overnight. Timothy, you need to suffer long in those things. In other words, Timothy, you are going to preach and preach and preach and preach and expound the word and bring the word forward and tell them the godly way of things, and there's going to be many times in your life, Timothy, that your preaching you think will be done in void. Because you won't see things. You won't see change. You know, sometimes as a preacher, you don't see the outward change, but I hope there's an inward change going on. I hope something's stirring. I hope something's moving. And when he says long suffer, he says keep bringing them the word even if they throw it away, even if they ridicule you for it, even if they turn their nose up to it, even if they seem like they don't get it, even if while you're preaching they got their noses in their tablets and their phones, even if when they're preaching they get up and they go to the bathroom in the middle of your message, even when they're preaching that they get up and they walk the halls and they hold other conversations with other people. Listen to me, he says continue to do it, suffer long, because suffering long is an act of love with your congregation, Timothy. Ain't nobody going to the bathroom today, are they? Listen to me. And I love this. It says, with all long suffering and doctrine. And doctrine. And doctrine. In other words, what he says is, Timothy, when you reprove and you rebuke and you exhort, you have to do so with the right motive. You have to do it on a biblical basis, Timothy. You have to do it because this is what the word says and you want what's best for him. Timothy, you don't reprove, you don't rebuke, and you don't exhort for your own gain. You don't reprove, rebuke, and exhort on your own whims and your own wants and your own desires and your own outcomes. You do it based on the authority of the word and the movement of God's people towards him. Everything I preach to you folks needs to have a biblical basis. If I don't bring you something or teach you to do something or train you to do something or preach you to do something that does not have a biblical basis, you have every right to call me out or not do it. It has to be biblical. And he's telling Timothy this, especially with all long suffering and all doctrine, because look at what the final crowd will be in the last days. Biblical preaching is not going to go over well in the last days. Look at what it says, verses three and four. First, we'll see that the denial that'll be happening by the way, let me, let me again put this in context for you. When Paul is talking about how biblical preaching is going to go over in the last days, he's not talking about out there. He's talking about what's already inside the church. People who profess to be Christians. People who show up on a Sunday morning. People who are actively a part of the church. That's what he's talking about. Notice their denial it says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. In other words, when you preach things that are biblical, Timothy, they're not going to want to hear them. Why? Because it flies in the face of culture and it flies in the face of what they want to do. Let me give you some examples. Tithing. Boy, that one doesn't go over well. Anytime I preach on tithing or do a sermon series on stewardship, I don't announce it ahead of time because I know that the attendance is going to be low. <laughs> People just don't want to hear it. Listen to me, and if you get offended every time you hear a preacher speak on tithing and it's biblical, you know where your God lies in your heart. Salvation. That it's through Jesus Christ alone and no one else. And listen to me, that it's offered by grace through faith and that is nothing you can do to earn it and there's nothing you can do to lose it. Now that sounds like good news to you, but to a lot of people, they're wondering, I gotta keep things up 
or so-and-so over there, you, you judge somebody else because of what they're doing or what they're not doing. Sanctification, people don't wanna hear that they gotta live a holy life that pleases the Lord and live according to biblical standards and shun the things of the world. Justification, holy living. Oh, here's some good ones that people don't wanna endure on sound doctrine. Sin, calling sin, sin especially the things that are in this world that our culture and our world try to tell us are no longer sin. We still live by a biblical standard. The wrath of God, which is a real thing that will come down on you if you don't have Jesus Christ as your savior. Judgment, each and every one of us will be judged for the deeds that we do here on earth in the body for the kingdom. If you're saved, you're going to be judged in trying to earn your righteousness. If you're, if you're not saved, you will be judged trying to earn your righteousness. If you are saved, every single thing you do that God has called you to do, whether you did it or not, or whether you did it with the right heart or not, will be exposed before the Lord. You don't want to be held in that accountability. A lot of people don't want to be held in that accountability. Can I tell you something? Even the pastor doesn't want to necessarily hear that message. But last time I checked, it said what? Preach the word. And it's there. And it's a major theme. <laughs> the judgment. Death. Guess what? Unless Jesus comes back, y'all are going to die. I'm going to die. But you know what? It's interesting. When we did our afterlife series, or even before that, when I preached on heaven, just preaching on heaven before that, it made people very uncomfortable. We don't like to think that we will someday die and that we won't be here. It makes people uncomfortable. So these are a lot of things you don't hear in modern churches, folks, because they're not feel good. And people in modern churches today worry about making sure that there's butts in the seats and so they won't give you anything in which you have to chew on or things that won't make you uncomfortable because they're just worried about you coming back and the numbers that come along with it and how that looks in the eyes of man. They'll feed you candy, they'll feed you sugar, they'll feed you treats, and they won't give you meat and potatoes that are necessary for you to grow. Come on. Death, hell, the second coming. How do I know about the second coming? I was in a meeting just recently with my district superintendent, and I hope she's not watching this morning because I'm going to talk about her for a second. It's not in a bad way, but she said the very first Sunday that she was district superintendent, she tuned in and watched our worship service. Yes, we're on the map for some reason. I don't know. But listen, she said your message was on the second coming of Christ. I can't remember going the whole way back to my childhood the last time I heard a message on the second coming of Christ. That's something the Bible tells us we should be looking forward to. It's our blessed hope. It's what we're supposed to be, it's what keeps us rejoicing and what keeps us looking forward. It's what keeps us going. It's the second coming and we don't, because we only want to focus on the here and now. The idea of Jesus coming back and us not being able to live out certain experiences in our life that comes with getting older, it makes us shudder. The second coming, heaven, Oh, here's a good one, human sexuality. By the way, God created male and female, J just so we're all on the same page with that. Two genders, that's it, male and female. And just so we're on the same page, a man is supposed to marry a woman, and a woman is supposed to marry a man. And anything else is not how God designed it or planned it. And just so we're on the same page, premarital sex is a sin. Oh, you didn't expect me to say that one, did you? That is also not in God's plan. And when we engage in those things, things happen that are not supposed to be how God, listen to me, it doesn't mean he can't move and he can't work through, right? And he can't redeem out of certain things. But listen to me, we like our sexual, by the way, looking at pornography is a sin. Does this make you uncomfortable? That's biblical preaching. It's God's standards. It's what he designed and what he put forward. And we should not question the person who designed it and put it in place for our good and our benefit. And then when we don't follow it, wonder why there's heartache, 
hardship, and death that comes in our life. I am moving on, I promise. Listen to me, it does not matter what the Bible says here. It doesn't matter what, it, it doesn't matter what my own beliefs say. It matters what the Bible says. It matters, and I like how in the, it says they will not endure sound doctrine. They will not endure sound, that's their denial. They'll throw it to the side, why? Because it's not what they wanna hear, and we see that. Look at their desire, it says, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's their desire. So this pastor tells me something I don't like. It's biblical, but I don't like it. It doesn't mess with my mindset, my experience, my tradition, my understanding. So I'm just gonna go find someone who does say those things. Boy, you could apply that to politics today, couldn't you? Right? We listen to the news source that agrees with us. Right? Because y'all know that the news media is, ain't nobody telling the truth, right? Ain't nobody telling the truth. Come on. We go to the source that agrees with us. I dare you, I dare you. Whatever your news source is, turn on the one that's in opposition to it and watch that as much as you watch the other one. No, let me dare you something. Turn off both of them and open this book and read it. We get people around us that say the things that we want to hear. And notice, here's a key word in this verse, folks. And again, it's indicative of the last days. Look at what it says. It says, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers. I'm sorry, it says that we're supposed to what the word? Preach the word. I'm called to be a biblical preacher. Timothy's called to be a biblical preacher. What's it say? Teacher. Two separate words, even if you want to go to the Greek. Two separate words here. Heap unto themselves teachers, having itching Years. Now look, teaching has a place in the church, but there's a difference. And you find that difference if you go back two chapters. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, you find characteristics of what a biblical teacher should be. J.B. talked about it when he preached. And notice how they contrast what a preacher's supposed to do. A teacher is supposed to what? It says, gentleness patience, meekness in instructing those that oppose themselves. Look, there's a place for that, but listen to me. We have a lot of people in our, we have a lot of churches in our world today, and I find it hilarious. They don't call the pastors preachers anymore. They call them teachers. Folks, that's a big difference. There's a difference between teaching and preaching. And you can see it in how it's supposed to be done. Because people are more inclined for the teaching that tickles their fancy, that makes them feel good, of, oh, you can't offend me. Oh, you gotta make you gotta make me feel all good and and rich, and oh, I gotta be walking on air when I walk out of there. Listen to me. I am not here to give you what you want to hear to feel good about yourself. I'm here to give you what God wants you to hear and let the Holy Spirit move and work on you as He sees need fit. There's a big difference there. They want teachers, they don't want preachers. Listen to me, biblical preaching is not polished, as you see today. Biblical preaching is not smooth. Biblical preaching is not cultured. Biblical preaching is politically incorrect. Biblical preaching should offend you. If you are not offended by the message of the gospel, you are not getting the real gospel. There should be things that offend you. And the biblical preacher is not here to win friends. The biblical preacher is not here to influence people. The biblical preacher is here to deliver the word of God to the people of God. Listen. We see the desire. We see their direction. Number four, and they shall turn away from their, turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto 
fables. So in other words, we have the truth right in front of us. It doesn't mesh with what we think we know or understand or experience, and so we're going to go to fables. What are fables? Made up things. Ain't it funny that we think we can know how the origin of the universe was created outside of God? Ain't it funny how we think we can know certain things that we have no way of knowing? We make things up, folks. We turn away from the truth of God's word unto things that we like to make up to feel good about ourselves, to rationalize our understanding, to get us away from God, right? That's like there's more than two genders. That's a fable. Evolution is a fable. God created, period. Global warming. I'm not trying to get political. But folks, listen to me. This world will not be, let me put it in this way. Listen to me. We are not going to destroy this world. God will destroy this world. All right? And we cannot change weather patterns. God does it. To think that we have that much control, to think that we have that much say, is not a biblical understanding. Salvation by works, to think that you can earn your way into heaven through serving or tithing or by doing certain things. Listen to me, folks. You're saved by the grace of God through faith. You're saved because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Anything else is a fable. Any other way that man will tell you that you can be saved through any other person is a made-up fable. It is a lie. We have a lot of Christian fables. In fact, that's what Timothy, or Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy, science falsely so-called. I love that. We'll say it's science, but what it actually is is fables. <laughs> Things that we think we can control and have an impact on that are the realm of God and no one else. You don't have that much control. We don't have that much control. That's why we need to put our faith and trust in what the Word of God says. Look, truth doesn't care about your feelings. You know that, right? Truth doesn't care about your feelings. Truth is truth, no matter how you feel about it. And biblical truth is the only truth there is. Last but not least, I promise I'll wrap up with this, we see a faithful call. So how is he supposed to be as he preaches the word and as he faces the future crowd in their denial and in their desire and in their direction, what does a faithful call look like to have that? Well, he says, number one, watch. Watch. He says, but watch thou in all things. In other words, Timothy, as the people get biblical preaching and as you see them turn away from it, as you see their desires go another direction, and as they won't listen to you, Timothy, listen, he says, watch in all things. In other words, be alert and be aware of the people that surround you in this time and of the events that are taking place in this time so that way when you preach, you can do so in a relevant way that hits what the people are going through. Listen to me, the gospel is always relevant but it needs to be delivered in a relevant way. Watch thou in all things. Not only watch, but work. He says, endure afflictions. Endure afflictions. Listen to me. When you, whether it's me preaching the word or when you live out a biblical life, you will have people come against you. You will face oppositions. You will face afflictions. In fact, today, when you speak biblical truth in a lot of circles in our culture, you will be called out on a hate crime. It's hateful to speak biblical truth in many circles today. They will come after you. Maybe not as aggressively as we see now, but those times are coming. Timothy, know this, when you preach biblical and you give them biblical doctrine and you give them sound doctrine that they cannot argue with other than with their feelings and their own experiences, they will threaten to leave your church unless you do something else. They will stop tithing and say, I'm going to withhold my money unless we do something else. Those are measures of control that happen in churches that are of the enemy. 
They will, Timothy, call you a fanatic. They'll tell you that you're a Bible thumper. They'll tell you that you're out of touch, that you're uneducated. But look what you need to do in, as you endure inflictions. The work also includes do the work of an evangelist. In other words, as those, those uh, afflictions come and those criticisms come and those disagreements come and those threats come, he says continue to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. Continue to tell them that Jesus Christ came to save them, that Jesus Christ came to rescue them, that Jesus Christ came to redeem them, and there is something beyond this world, and there is something beyond their experience, and there is something beyond their knowledge, and that something is the redeeming work of the cross found in Christ Jesus. Continue to preach the good news. And last but not least, a faithful call in biblical preaching has a witness. Make full proof of thy ministry. Make full proof of thy ministry. In other words, what he's telling Timothy is don't just speak the word of God, but you've got to live it. If you're going to preach on biblical forgiveness, you've got to model biblical forgiveness. If you're going to preach on grace, you've got to model grace. If you're going to preach on long-suffering, guess what, Timothy, you've got to suffer long. If you're going to preach on people giving you patience, Timothy, guess what, Timothy? You've got to give patience on the other side. If you want people to be hospitable to you, Timothy, and preach on the hospitality that we see in Christ, Timothy, guess what? You've got to be hospitable to them. Timothy, if you want and you desire to preach on evangelism and reaching a lost world, Timothy, they've got to see you go forward first and preach and evangelize to a lost world. Timothy, if you want them to confess and you want to see them have an attitude of prayer and repentance, Timothy, you gotta be real to them and they gotta see you confess your sins. They gotta see you have an attitude of repentance. They gotta see you humble yourself in the sight of God. There's gotta be proof. He says make full proof of thy ministry. They gotta see the fruit, Timothy. Whether they accept the fruit or not, they got to see it. And that's the one that's the sticking point because I can get up here and I can get excited about the word of God all I want. I pray that you see it. I pray that you see it from me. I pray that you see it from Pastor Peter. I pray that you see it from JB when he comes up in here and he shares the word. I pray that you see it from Matt when he comes up here and shares the word. I pray that you see it from Pastor Harris when he shares the word with you. I pray that you see it with whoever takes the pulpit because words can be empty if not follow through on. Make foolproof. Timothy, they can't, they can't accuse you of anything if you model it. And if the accusations do come, Timothy, they won't stand and they won't hold. And that's an important place to end on as the worship team comes up to, to pray for us, or to, yeah, to play for us. You can pray for us too, please. <laughs> Listen to me. I want to end with the first part of verse 1. Some of you may have thought we skipped over it, but I was saving it till the end. Because here's why it's so important to make full proof of your ministry. Look, whether you are full-time in ministry as a pastor, whether, whether you are full-time in ministry in something else, right? Full-time in ministry being a stay-at-home mom, full-time in ministry working your, your, your job in the world, full-time in ministry doing whatever it may be that God has called you to. Listen to me, this is why it's so important when you live a biblical lifestyle and why it's important for you to take a biblical stand and to live out your faith by the word of God. Here's why it's so important, because the charge that Christ has given you or the charge that you have been given in the sight of Jesus Christ and in the sight of God, look at the second part of verse, of verse one, it says, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. In other words, one day, I will have to give an account for every sermon I ever preached. I will have to give an account for every Bible study I ever taught. 
I will have to give an account for my actions as a husband, as a father, and as a pastor in your view, how you have seen me live them out. I will have to give an account before God for them. And listen to me. I use myself as an example, but whatever God has called you to, and to do it in a biblical way of which he's given you the instructions for, you too. Number one, the Lord Jesus Christ sees it, God Almighty sees it, and one day you will have to give an account for it. There's no escape. Come on, we're good at making rationalizations down here as to why we can't do something. We're good at making excuses as to why we can't commit. We're good at making up reasons as to why we can't go and why we can't be a part of things and why we can't be in worship on a Sunday or why we can't do Listen to me. Once you're before God, <laughs> he knows all the secrets and all the motives of your heart. There's no hiding. There's no hiding. And you, you might be able to fool man. There's no fool in God. I love it when I hear people say, I'll go and I'll try to correct them or I'll try to help them in some kind. Well, pastor, God knows my heart. <laughs> yeah, and that should scare the hell out of you. <laughs> You're right. I don't, but God does. That's probably the worst thing you can say. <laughs> God does. What's on your heart today? in terms of what God has called you to? And are you walking in the biblical way? Are you walking in the biblical way? Will you bow your head with me this morning? The Bible says here that the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. I, I know that this message is mostly towards people who are saved. But folks, as a biblical preacher, I have a mandate to give an invitation. As a biblical teacher, I don't know who here does not know Jesus Christ. In fact, you may have attended or been a member of this church and you still have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You're playing church today. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And if you have not accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, if you have not gone and accepted his free gift of salvation through dying on the cross and raising from the dead, if you have not professed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that Christ has raised him from the dead, that sin is still hanging on you. That's what the Bible says. And that you will have to pay it yourself if you die without Christ. And that is an eternity in hell. The wages of sin is death. It kills you in this life and it kills you spiritually in the next. But praise God, the verse doesn't stop there. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus Christ came and he took your sin debt and he nailed it to a cross. His blood paid for it. All you have to do is receive it. And he did it because he loves you. And he wants you to be reconciled unto God and live and eternity in the place that God has prepared. Have you accepted his free gift of salvation today? If not, the altar is open. Come forward. Or grab me after the service if you don't feel compelled to come forward. But make a move. Make a move. Don't put it off. Christian, you're here this morning. We talked about biblical preaching. We hit on some things that a lot, of, a lot of churches won't touch anymore because they don't want people out their doors. And maybe today will be the last day that you show up here because I offended you in some kind of a way. I don't know. But I want you to remember, number one, I didn't offend you, that book offended you. Because that's what it says. I didn't tell you anything this morning that, that doesn't, this book doesn't say. You can do theological gymnastics to try to get to a liberal idea of what the Bible says today in this world, but it's liberal gymnastics. You take the word for what it says. Where are you not living out your life biblically? Where have you backed down? Where have you compromised? The Lord will reveal it to you. 
Get it straight with him today. Get it right with him today. You take that step to get right with him and to walk in a biblical manner of life, listen to me, he will give you the strength to go forward. He will give you the resolve to go forward. You will face afflictions. But your joy will be overflowing. Walk in him. Walk in his ways. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And now, Lord, we come before you and 